are at our next sermon in uh, The Keys to a Blessed Life, and you really can't have a blessed life unless you're right with God. And so that's really what we're pointing to. Uh, so far, we've talked about the preaching of the gospel. If we don't share the gospel with others, if the gospel isn't shared with us and with our own lives, we can't have a blessed life. Having a blessed life ultimately comes back to being right with the Lord, and, and that's what we want every person in this auditorium to be, is right with God. Uh, and Clyde delivered that first message. Then the next message that we talked about was faith, and how Abraham was the model of faith that we should ourselves have. Uh, he was obedient to the Lord to the point where he was willing to believe that God could bring life from non-life. Um, Sarah's womb was dead. They were almost 100 years old. And Abraham continued to act in such a way as if God would fulfill that promise. And then he was willing to even give up the promised child, uh, his son Isaac, um, on a mountain. And he brought up Isaac. He was willing to sacrifice him on this mountain. Um, and so he serves as a model of faith. Not that he just believed God, but that his belief led him to a point of action. That's what kind of faith we should have. Not just intellectual assent, but the, these ideas, these thoughts, these beliefs lead to what we do. And then last week, we talked about repentance. Simply was this, and hopefully you walked away with this big idea of Rick screaming like a little girl as uh, someone did a U-turn, right? And that's what repentance is, is a U-turn. Not necessarily Rick screaming, but the U-turning part, where you're walking towards sin and you decide to turn away from it and walk back towards God. Today we're going to be talking about a highly controversial issue for no good reason, but a highly controversial issue being baptism. Baptism is something that a lot of people have a different opinion about. But we are a church, a Severn Christian church, we are what's called a restoration church. And here's what that means. We speak where the Bible speaks, we are silent where the Bible is silent. We do all things in Bible ways, calling Bible names by Bible things. That's what we believe. And so if we are going to have a blessed life when it comes to the subject of baptism, we want to get back to what the Bible has to say about it. Let's get away from creeds. Let's get away from different ideas that came in a couple hundred years later. Let's just stick with what the Bible says. And so today we're going to be covering a lot of ground. Uh, we're going to be going through uh, several scriptures about what baptism means, what baptism is, and I hope that you will come to a clearer understanding of the subject of baptism. For those of you who are Christians, and your idea of baptism is like here, like you've got it, this will serve as a great reminder that you can remember your baptism and the promise that God gave you from obeying the gospel. But before we get there, I have another story about keys. When I was uh, 16 years old, I drove this Ford Mazda. Uh, it was a stick shift, and uh, I had no idea how to drive a stick shift. It took me forever to learn. I thought that you had to let the entire clutch out before you could press on the gas. And so as many of you know who drive stick shift, it popped every time. And the definition of an idiot is someone who repeats the same process over and over again, expecting a different outcome. Well, that was me. And so, uh, even, so I was able to drive it, and I learned how to drive it. And uh, I have a habit of losing things. It's been part of my track record. I forget where I place things. And so uh, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I lost my keys to my truck. I locked my keys in my truck, at least I thought. And if you have a truck, what's cool is some of these trucks have a little hatch window on the back. And you can take a butter knife, you can actually pop them open if you get it right. Uh, but I just, I didn't know that at that time. And so I thought I locked my keys in my vehicle and I had no way to get in. So we had AAA service and uh, they came out and they actually cut a new key on site for my truck. But it took a couple hours. I was there until dark time after football practice and it was miserable. And so he has to cut two keys, one for the door and one for the ignition. The good news is, is it was free, because it was AAA. But I felt like a complete, uh, let's say, moron, and because I lost my keys. And so I had to go through all of this trouble. And uh, so I got my keys, and I'm going home, and I'm getting my books out. I put my key in my book bag. But I could have sworn I did not see it. It was as if Angel went back in time and hid my keys from me, being my wife, and then placed them in the bag where I had just looked where they were. If you, you get that joke if you were here a couple weeks ago. Uh, I said that Angel like hides my keys from me on purpose. And then when I blame her, uh, she puts them where they should be. Uh, she doesn't really do that. And uh, it actually happened this last week. I started to blame her in my own mind for something. And uh, she was totally you know, guilt-free. But at least I didn't tell her about it. She knows about it now. Yeah. <laughs> 
So here's the thing, right? The key was right there. It was right in front of me, and I didn't see it. And that's, that's how it is with baptism, is that the, the subject, the scriptures, they are right there. They are easy to read. Anybody could pick up their Bible and read what the Bible has to say about baptism. And so I don't want you to rely on what I have to say about baptism this morning. If God wrote the Bible, let's look to the Bible and let's see what it says. And then you can come to your own conclusion. Uh, and so I hope that that satisfies uh, your mind. But Angel's awesome, right? She is my spouse. She's amazing. Uh, she is, is so great. I, don't, I definitely married up. There's no doubt about that one. Uh, I've shared this with you before. The last church that I preached at, somebody came up and their daughter was like, I just can't believe, I don't get it. I can't, you married her? Like she's married to you? And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, thanks a lot. As this, this is supposed to be a compliment of some kind, right? <laughs> Not cool. But anyways, I know it, right? I married up and, uh, and so it's awesome. And that marriage, it, it served as an amazing opportunity. Even though I was committed to her, right? We were, we were engaged. I gave her a ring, I pledged myself to her, I loved her, and she loved me. We were not officially married until the, uh, the minister announced our marriage. Even though we gave each other rings as, as symbols of our love towards each other, and we said vows, she pledges her life to me, and I pledge my life to her, it wasn't official, it wasn't recognized by God until the minister says the words, husband and wife. And that's how it is with baptism. There are a lot of people who have good intentions. There are a lot of people who love God, and God loves them. They've made vows and pledges to God. They want to serve the Lord. Uh, they have all intentions to be what God wants them to be. But the question isn't when the person feels like they're a Christian. The question isn't when a person feels like or thinks that God forgives them. The real question is, when does God say you're forgiven? Just like, when does God say you're married? Paul put it like this. When he gets into the subject of baptism, um, Paul defines baptism uh, as immersion or submersion or plunging in water. Uh, the Bible has three different words for dealing with things with water. The first one, the Greek word is baptizo. It means to submerge, immerse, or plunge. Uh, and this is the word that is used anytime baptism is referred to in the New Testament. The primary usage is water-related. It could also be used metaphorically, for instance. Jesus went into a baptism of pain and suffering. Well, that doesn't mean water was put on him. What that means is that his entire body was put through pain and discomfort when he hung on the cross, the baptism of suffering. But the primary usage is submersion. Uh, and any time the Bible refers to baptism, it always means total immersion in water. And so whenever you read the scriptures, when it uses the word baptism, don't think of these other Greek words that I've put up on the screen for you. Here's, here's another one, uh, rantizo. It means to sprinkle. Any time baptism is used in the New Testament, sprinkle is never mentioned. Never mentioned. There's another Greek word for pour. Uh, it's katacheo. And basically, it means to pour water on. Anytime baptism is referred to in the New Testament, this word pour is never used. So what does that mean? That means if we believe what God wrote, if we believe what the apostles said and practiced, anytime we refer to baptism, we will always refer to it as immersion. If I could give you a symbol of what baptism really like, is, it looks like, Paul used burial as, as a symbol, Right? When you bury someone, you don't throw dirt on their head. You don't throw dirt on their body. Uh, they're not buried outside of, of the ground. They were either, their entire body was either placed inside of a tomb or they were buried inside of the ground. And this is used in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. And Paul says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. If we are going to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent, if we are going to hold that as a value of our church, as a value uh, as Christian leaders, we are going to hold to the fact that baptism is a burial. It is an immersion. It is a complete surrounding of the body with water. And if you think about it, like maybe you've never been in church and this is your first time, you're going to be like, Christians are so weird. 
I will forgive you if your entire body is placed in water. I mean, think about that, right? For those of us who are Christians, this is normal. But for the average person, baptism really is just this thing that they really just don't really know a whole lot about. And so baptism is a burial. It's where we die to the old man and we live to the new. And it is this incredible act that God commands and demands all of us to undergo. But if baptism is something that you do, how about this? Therefore, baptism is a work. And because baptism is something that you do, and baptism is a work, and the Bible says we're not saved by works, baptism isn't essential. That seems logical, doesn't it? Here's the problem. When the Bible says you are not saved by works, it did not mean you are not saved by anything that you do, either mentally or physically. When Paul wrote things like, you are saved by grace, not by works, what Paul was referring to are the works of law. In other words, Paul was saying, you are not saved by the responses to the law code. You are saved by grace through faith. And I'll explain what I mean uh, here in a minute. First of all, if we define works, for instance, as anything that you do, we are in a lot of trouble. Because Jesus defined believing as something that you do. And if Jesus defines believing as something that you do, that means belief is a work. And that means even believing is a work that earns you salvation. And so people who don't believe that uh, you need to be baptized in order to be saved have found themselves in a very strange uh, situation, that the belief itself is a work that earns you salvation. Let me read you a scripture in John chapter 6, verses 27 through 29. Uh, Jesus was feeding people, and as we like to do in the Christian church is feed people, right? And so he's feeding people, and they come up to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, let us do the works of God. What may we do that we may work like God? And look at Jesus' response here. He says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you uh, from the Father, for God has set his seal. Then look at this. They said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered unto them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. And so Jesus himself classifies a work as something that you do. Now, I don't think anybody in the evangelical world, uh, in our brotherhood being just Christian churches, would say that work is belief, or that belief earns you salvation, even though it's something that you do. I mean, think about repentance. Repentance is something that you do, right? You turn away from sin and back towards God. God doesn't do that for you. And so baptism is in the same category, Baptism is not a work that earns you salvation. It is not a response to the law code. Baptism is this organic command that God wants you to obey in order to receive salvation. And so I can read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 like this. It is for by grace you have been saved through the channel of faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Well, what do I mean by that? What does Paul mean by that? so that no one may boast. There are three categories that you can place works in. The new covenant category. Any type of command that Jesus gives you uh, in becoming a Christian is, is, is a new covenant work, right? Tithing, uh, attending uh, the Lord's table, uh, taking the Lord's supper, for instance, being charitable, um, being kind, being good, being gracious. These are all works that are in a response to the new covenant law. How about the old covenant law, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me is an example of the Ten Commandments. The idea that if I keep these set of rules, I can earn my salvation is a works-based salvation program. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches we are saved by grace. But then there's a third category. Long before the new covenant came or the old covenant, you had what's called the moral law. And maybe you've heard about this. And certainly you have experienced this yourself. Long before God gave his written word, the Bible says he inscribed his law upon our hearts that we may obey it by instinct and that it does take a lot of hard work in telling yourself no to disobey it. Let me give you an example. Every culture throughout all time has always believed it was wrong to murder. Now they might disagree over what is real murder, such as fighting with a tribe uh, that you can kill or, you know, somebody that murders your, your family member. But no culture has ever said that it is okay for anyone to just kill anybody that they've wanted to. C.S. Lewis points this out. Uh, marriage, for instance. 
Every culture uh, has always believed you just can't really have any woman that you've wanted to. Now, they may disagree over whether you can have one or four, but he says no culture, and he studied this, no culture has ever just said you can have any woman that you want. There's a certain moral law that we all have on our hearts that we respond to. And so any action that you do in response to that moral law is a works-based system. If you think you can keep that moral law and earn yourself salvation, you're wrong because we all make mistakes. We all mess up. And so baptism certainly is not a work. Let me show you a, a quote from Martin Luther. Martin Luther was in the Reformation, and this is what he believed about baptism and salvation. Regarding the person that is baptized, he says this, may he receive in the water the promise of salvation. May he receive in the water the promise of salvation. Martin Luther, what is to be called sometimes the king of the Reformation, had no problem corresponding baptism with salvation by grace through faith. That wasn't a problem with him. It wasn't actually until a guy named Zwingli and John Calvin, maybe you've heard Calvinism, they came along in the 1500s, they redefined what faith was, they redefined what works were, and so from that point on, you had this misunderstanding of what it meant to be saved by works and what it meant to be saved by grace. And so if I could put it in a very simple formula for you, I would simply say this, baptism is not a work that you do, baptism is a work that God does to you. That's why we believe we are saved in baptism. Let me show you Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. It says this, In him, being Jesus, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. In baptism you were buried, where God did the work, where he circumcised your heart according to your faith. It is by your faith that you were raised with Jesus in baptism, in other words. And so is baptism a work? Absolutely not. Martin Luther went on to say this. He says, to this you may answer, yes, it is true that our works are of no use for salvation. Baptism, however, is not our works, but God's. God works are necessary for salvation. They do not exclude, but rather demand faith. And so Martin Luther, when it came to this subject of baptism, got it right. Baptism is not the means of salvation. There's no power in that water back there, right? I don't come in before service and, and bless the water, so to speak, okay? It's just water. But God does the work when you're being baptized. It's where he saves you. It's when he saves you, in other words. And so when the early apostles taught about baptism, they included it naturally as part of the gospel. It wasn't a response uh, to God's law. It was part of the good news about Jesus. For anyone who's ever researched how many people it takes to really give a peer-reviewed, clinically-based uh, fact about reality. You look in psychology, you look in science. Many of you have your Bibles here this morning. I have the New American Standard Bible. Um, the NIV, for instance, over 70 Greek scholars helped interpret the NIV. 70. And so here's a really good principle. If ever you find one man proclaiming to have all the truth and he does it in secret, there's probably a problem with that, okay? Number two, one scripture doesn't say all there is to know about one subject. I mean, if it takes 70 people to interpret the Bible, and so that it is peer-reviewed, uh, it is not based on an individual, it goes through different types of circumstances and, and standards that it has to pass in order to be accurate, if it has to go through that, when it comes to the subject of baptism, doesn't it make sense to look at all the scriptures and then render our conclusion? But unfortunately, people will read one verse in the Bible uh, that says, if you have faith, you may be saved, and they'll think that that's all the Bible has to say about salvation. And something that we try to preach and teach here is that rather than look at one scripture and render our conclusion, we want to look at all the scriptures about a certain subject and then say, this is what the Bible teaches. So when we talk about salvation, when we talk about baptism, we want to look at what all the scriptures have to say just like they did in the translation, or if you look at a psychology book, you got a lot of different people, a lot of different perspectives coming to the same conclusion. Let me start you off with Jesus. 
Jesus says this in John chapter 3, verse 5. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now that word of is a preposition, and it introduces a prepositional phrase, of, water, and spirit. It's connected together at one time, which shows that your water baptism, your immersion, has to happen uh, when you are saved, when the spirit comes into your life. And if you don't do that, he says you can't enter into the kingdom of God. So this is a really important command, in other words. Jesus goes on to say this, uh, before he ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Jesus did not say, he who believes and is saved shall be baptized. He says, he who is uh, baptized, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, future tense. When he tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, he says, I want you to go into the entire world. I want you to make disciples. I want you to baptize them. And I want you to teach them everything that I've commanded you. Baptism was a part of the gospel proclamation. Jesus is Lord. He wants to save you from your sins. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. Judgment is coming, but grace is now. And if you'll be able to turn away from your sins and be baptized in Jesus' name, you can be forgiven. That's Jesus. That's what Jesus had to say about baptism. So for Jesus and the apostles, in other words, and the early church, baptism was obedience within the gospel. It was not works of law. Well, how about another pretty important guy named Peter, right? I'm kind of like Peter. Sometimes I say things that I don't mean. Sometimes I open my big mouth and I want to shove my foot in it, right? Can you agree with me? Uh, No, nobody's like me. I'm kind of like Peter, you know what I mean? Sometimes I can let the emotions get the best of me in a situation. I've been really trying to control that, you know, just like breathing techniques or whatever and telling myself, don't be a jerk. Uh, And it doesn't work sometimes. But anyway, so Peter was the first person ever to give a gospel sermon. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, Peter had just delivered this dynamite sermon where he preached about the resurrection of Jesus. And he says in verse 36, this Jesus whom you have crucified, Jews, God has made both Lord and Christ. And if you're standing there and you've just been accused of crucifying Jesus, that's probably going to do something, right? It's going to make you sick to your stomach. When I get a bill in the mail that I didn't expect, it kind of makes me sick, you know what I mean? I can't imagine what it would be like hearing that I crucified Jesus, although we did talk about that last week, that it was our sin that ultimately put Jesus on the cross. So we could place ourselves in that category. And so they asked the greatest question that could ever be asked. Men and brethren, apostles, what can we do? What shall we do? What do I need to do to make this situation right? And in verse 38, Peter said this. Because they had already believed, he said, repent and be immersed, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter connects baptism with forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. Well, where did he get that information? He got it from Jesus. When Peter was preaching to this guy named Cornelius, the first Gentile that was ever saved, the Jews were prejudiced, by the way, the early Christians. Even though they had all of this great stuff going on with Jesus, they didn't want to share it with people like you and I, right? They only wanted to share it with Jews. And so for 10 years, they refused to share the gospel with Gentiles. And so Peter goes to this guy named Cornelius. He was a Roman soldier, right? He was a centurion, and uh, probably a really, like, masculine, strong, tough, good-looking guy like myself, and, uh, you know, kind of similar there. And so he went, and he, I know, liars go to hell, Rick, okay? All right. So he goes to preach the gospel, and while he is preaching, God sends Peter a message that these people deserve to be saved. And look what Peter has to say about this. He's recounting this story to the other Christians, and he says, uh, Cornelius was, this is what Cornelius told Peter, right? Uh, and, And he, Cornelius, reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is called Peter, brought here. Look at this. And he will speak words. He will speak something to you by which you and your household will be saved. Not through an experience, not in his prayer closet, not as an infant, but Peter is going to tell you something 
that you are going to need to know in order to be saved. And look at what Peter told them. We find the actual story in Acts chapter 10. He sees this happen and he says, Surely no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in Jesus' name. You see, Peter got it. He knew that in order to be saved, you had to have this thing called immersion, baptism in Jesus' name. And so he commanded it. He wasn't going to fight against God. And then probably one of the most powerful passages of Scripture, Peter went on to write this in his epistle. In 1 Peter chapter 3, he talks about the story of Noah and how the water actually saved Noah from God's wrath and condemnation. And he says that serves as a symbol. And in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 21, he says this, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. It's not the removal of dirt from your body. But it is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This sacred act of baptism is so very important that Peter says it saves you. Not because it's a physical thing that's going on, but because of your faith in the resurrection of Jesus at the time you are baptized is when you are saved. The Apostle Paul, he was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He hated the church, persecuted the church threw them in jail, oversaw their deaths, throwing rocks at at Christians until uh, they had so much brain trauma that they had no more life in them. I mean, this is pretty terrible stuff here, okay? He ended up converting because he had this experience with Jesus uh, in Acts chapter 9, and you can read about that story. And for three days, he's praying. He is totally blind. He cannot see a thing. But God told Paul something. Jesus said, Paul, Someone's going to come share a message with you, and his name's going to be Ananias, and he's going to tell you what you need to do in order to be saved. Once again, words. And we find this story. In Acts chapter 9, verse 17, Ananias says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me to you, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. You'll regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He regained his sight, and he was baptized. The logical connection is this. When we are immersed in Jesus' name, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. That lines up exactly with what Paul, or with what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. When Paul gave his testimony later on, um, he, he said this in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, He he recounts this of Ananias. Ananias said, now why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. Paul made the logical connection that when he got up and went and got baptized, he received the forgiveness of sins and crying and calling out to God, Lord, save me. Do to me what you promised to do. I need your Holy Spirit. I need your forgiveness. Baptism is pretty important. Anytime Paul preached the gospel, and I, we're just going to quickly reference these, for instance. Lydia and her entourage, first female church, man. All women. Pretty cool, right? Baptism. When he shared the gospel with the Philippian jailer in his household, baptism. When he preached the gospel to the Ephesian disciples of Apollos, who were baptized under John, but that didn't count because it wasn't Christian baptism, he baptized them. It's what led Paul to say this. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 27, For you all are sons of God through faith in Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. It's like a Jesus jacket, man. You know what I mean? I mean, it's pretty cool. That baptism is so uniquely important. It is an absolute key to Christianity. Uh, It doesn't make any sense for a Christian to not want to be baptized. One of my favorite stories as we kind of come to the conclusion of this message is a, uh, an Ethiopian eunuch, right? He was a, uh, a black Jew. He converted Ju- to Judaism, and he went to Jerusalem on behalf of his queen, and on his way back, he got a scroll of Isaiah. I actually saw an old scroll um, of Isaiah uh, written from about the, the 1100s, and it was really neat. I got to actually touch it and look at it, and uh, they were so meticulous. If they made one mistake, they scrapped the whole thing. I mean, It's not like typing on your computer, okay? We're talking about a scroll that is hundreds of feet long, 
if maybe tens of feet long, if they can get it into that. And if you wrote the entire book of Isaiah, which is 66 chapters, and you messed up at the end, it got tossed. We were talking about a very meticulous society that really cared about accuracy when it came to the translation of text, which is a very powerful argument. The Bible we have today is the Bible that they had thousands of years ago. But irregardless, so he's reading this scroll of Isaiah, and he's riding along in his chariot, and, uh, and there's this guy named Philip there. And the Holy Spirit told Philip, hey, there's going to be a guy in a chariot. Go up and share the gospel with him. And so, like any good evangelist, Philip takes off running, you know, running towards the chariot. And he gets up there and he says, hey, man, do you know what you're reading? And he's like, I have absolutely no idea what I'm reading. You ever had that problem? You look in the Bible and you're like, I have, I have no idea what I'm reading. And it's like, maybe because you're holding it upside down. You're like, oh, okay, that was it. That got me. But there's a lot of things in the Bible that we don't understand, right? And so he says, how can I understand this unless someone explains it to me? And so Philip takes this opportunity to share the gospel with him. And so he says, please tell me who this prophet is. It's Isaiah 53. It talks about the suffering servant, the man of sorrows, who would become the penalty for our sins. Uh, He would carry our sorrows. He would sacrifice himself to make us right with God. And and the eunuch says, who is this talking about? And look what it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 35. And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Well, hold on a second. He preached unto him Jesus, and somehow baptism got thrown in there? What does that mean? It means baptism is part of the gospel. It means that when he shared Jesus with him, he not only taught about who Jesus was, but he taught about what Jesus wanted his followers to do. And so he comes to this big body of water, and and look at what it goes on to say. And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, uh, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Remember, baptizo is immersion it doesn't say philip ran down to the water and scooped some up and came up and you know and and and, and put it on his head and baptized them no they both had to go down in it was a full body immersion and so if i could put it in a very succinct message i would say this baptism is the time of salvation that occurs in the mind of god it is not the means of salvation which is faith you see i get baptized every summer i like to go to the ocean i like to go to the pole My whole body is immersed in water. But unless faith accompanies baptism with a repentant heart, it is nothing. Baptism is absolutely important. And so if you can remember the Colossian passage that we read, having been buried with him through baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through the working of faith, according to God, who raised him from the dead. And so we could ask ourselves this morning, And I know it's been a very systematic approach to what the Bible has to say about baptism. A lot of scriptures we've gone through this morning, but I wanted to give you an entire complete view of baptism because it's an essential key. And so what does it mean to be saved? Well, we are saved by God's grace. Just because you are baptized does not mean that you have earned it or you have worked for it. It simply means that you've accepted it the way God wanted you to. So God's grace is a free gift of life, and man, am I glad because I mess up all the time and I make mistakes. Second of all, we are saved in the means of our faith, of our confession. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was raised from the dead. And so God's grace, if you could picture it, pours down from heaven through this channel of faith which meets us in baptism. And the moment you are baptized is not something that you do, but it is, as Martin Luther said, the work of God. It is God working in your heart and in your life. We are saved after we repent, which means there's been a loyalty shift. You no longer believe that you can live life towards sin. You now believe that you can live life back towards God. I want to follow after Jesus. And then we are saved at this time, this amazing, incredible moment called baptism. Now, the reason why we're saved at the time of baptism is because we're all sinners. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. We all miss the boat. We all do things that God doesn't want 
us to do. And that's what's so awesome about grace is God is willing to give that to any person who's willing to meet these commands. Any person. And so we're not lost in our heart. We are lost in the mind of God. And we have to get God to change his mind about us. And God says this, I promise I will change my mind about you if you are willing to be baptized in Jesus' name. And a scripture I didn't share with you, but I'm going to now, is after Peter in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 39, it says this, for this promise is unto you and your children and all who are far off. If I were to be honest, I would say there are some times in my life I do not feel saved. I feel like God hates me sometimes. I feel like my mistakes just mount up to God to where how could this guy possibly love me? But God promises. He promises, I will save you. And if you have been baptized, praise God. That is a promise that you have that no one can take away from you. And no matter how much you beat yourself up over it, it is yours forever. But if you haven't been baptized, Jesus, Peter, Paul, Philip have all said, you have got to do this thing for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to pray. We're going to sing a song of invitation where we're going to open that up to you now. If you want to obey the gospel and be baptized the way that Jesus, Paul, and Philip, uh, and, and Peter have said to do it, then we're going to let you do that now. So I'm going to ask that you stand and pray with me. Father, uh, we just pray that we'll be able to remember that you love us, remember that you've forgiven us, Remember that for those who have been baptized into Christ, Lord, we've been buried with you. We've been clothed with you. We've been united with you. We've been circumcised in our heart by you, Lord, and we thank you so much for that. God, I pray for that person who has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, uh, who has not been baptized. Lord, I pray that they will just remove all of the things that they've ever thought about baptism, uh, maybe their, their history, maybe their experiences, maybe their family, but they will just accept what the Bible has to say because it's what you have written for us, Lord. God, I want to give you thanks. I want to give you thanks for Jesus. I want to give you thanks for this offering that we're getting ready to pass around. That as we pass these, these plates, Lord, these bags, that it will be a sign uh, to you from our hearts that we trust you, not only with our salvation, but with our, our life, Lord. Bless this offering, Lord, that it may be fruitful, that it may multiply the kingdom here, and that lives would be changed because of the work of Seven Christian Church. God, I pray for that person to come down this aisle now as we sing this song of invitation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.